The overall process of cellular respiration involves taking glucose, combining it with oxygen, uh, and breaking it down into carbon dioxide and water. During this process, ADP is converted into ATP. Cellular respiration takes place in the mitochondria. A, mitochondria, a mitochondrion has a very characteristic appearance with a double membrane. The inner membrane has these long uh, finger-like projections into the interior of the mitochondrion. These are called cristae. One cell can have many mitochondria if it is an energy intensive cell. This is a micrograph of a section of heart muscle. These uh, sections right here, which are sort of striated or, or striped, are the muscle fibers themselves, but powering those muscle fibers are all of these mitochondria. So one cell can be packed full of many, many mitochondria if that cell performs a very highly energy intensive task. This is a very simplified diagram of a mitochondria, but it includes all of the pieces of the mitochondria that we need to know about. The mitochondria has an outer membrane, then it has an inner membrane um, within it, and that inner membrane is deeply folded in many, many cristae. Cristae is the plural of crista, so you would say there is one crista, many cristae. The reason that it's so deeply folded is because the membrane itself, the inner membrane itself, uh, performs a very important role in cellular respiration. The more membrane that we have per mitochondrion, the more cellular respiration we can do. So a deeply folded membrane allows us to perform cellular respiration more efficiently. Each mitochondrion can do more respiration than it would be able to if the membrane was smooth. Between the inner membrane and the outer membrane is a space. That space is called the intermembrane space because it's in between the two membranes. And finally, the space inside the inner membrane uh, is called the matrix. So we have matrix on the inside, then the inner membrane, then the inner membrane space, then the outer membrane. Cellular respiration takes place over a series of stages. Uh, and I'm going to give you an overview of what all of those stages are before we go into the details about what's happening at each stage. So we're starting with a glucose molecule. Um, here's glucose over here um, on the left. And the first stage for this glucose is to undergo something called glycolysis. During glycolysis, we take our glucose and we split it from one six carbon sugar into two three carbon sugars. Those are called pyruvate. So glycolysis is the first step, and glycolysis actually does not take place in the mitochondrion at all. It takes place in the cytoplasm of the cell. Those pyruvates then get moved to the mitochondria for stage two. Stage two is something called the citric acid, acid cycle. So pyruvate is transformed into something called acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA then enters into a cycle, the citric acid cycle. Much like the Calvin cycle, this involves creating something and then regenerating the uh, initial starting materials for the cycle to continue. The outputs of the citric acid cycle are CO2 and two more additional molecular batteries. These are high energy molecules. They contain a lot of energy, but they are not ATP. And so most of the enzymes of your body cannot use these two molecules. They are called NADH and FADH2. Okay, um, so the last stage of cellular respiration is to take those NADHs and those FADH2s and use those to charge up ATP. So most of your body can't use these two, um, these two molecules, so we're going to transform them into ATP, and we're going to do that using something called the electron transport chain. This is very similar to the electron transport chain that we're familiar with from photosynthesis. Uh, the electron transport chain uses oxygen and it creates water as a byproduct. 
Okay, so where does the ATP come into this, um, to this whole picture? You actually make ATP at every one of these stages. At glycolysis, you make two ATP for gluco per glucose. During the citric acid cycle, you generate two ATP per glucose. But during the electron transport chain, that final step, converting NADH and FADH2, uh, and using that energy to generate ATP, that creates a net total of 32 ATP per glucose. And that's the stage where oxygen is involved. So without oxygen, you can't run your electron transport chain and you cannot generate this massive amount of ATP that you need to survive. So glycolysis. Glycolysis is the first stage of cellular respiration. Um, you can parse this word. We've got glyco, which is another, uh, another root word for sugar, like, uh, like glucose, glyco, and lysis, if you remember lyse, lyse always means to break. So this is the sugar breaking stage. We're going to start with glucose and we're going to break it apart into some smaller molecules that the cell can, can then deal with more easily. Glycolysis takes place outside the mitochondria in the cytoplasm of the cell. We're going to start with a glucose. And a glucose has six carbons, of course. Now, we're going to break this glucose apart, and as we break it apart, I'd like you to remember that we're going to get a net gain of two ATPs during glycolysis. Glycolysis releases some energy. And so this process of breaking apart glucose into smaller sugars is an exergonic process. However, it has an activation energy. If this is glucose, and this is our pro final product of glycolysis, uh, which is a molecule called pyruvate, then we've got to get over this energy hill. We have to put in some energy to get over this hump. This is called the energy investment stage. So we're going to take glucose and we're going to transform it into another six carbon sugar called 1-fructose bisphosphate, but I'm not even going to write that word down because I don't need you to know it. It is a six carbon sugar that has two phosphates attached to it. Where did those phosphates come from? They came from ATP. So before we get any energy out, we have to put some energy in. We put two ATP in and we get two ADP out and those phosphates wound up stuck to this fructose bisphosphate. Fructose bisphosphate is very unstable. It falls apart on its own into two three carbon sugars. Each of those three carbon sugars still has a phosphate attached to it. These three carbon sugars, these are G3Ps. You remember from photosynthesis, G3Ps are the building blocks of glucose. Well, these are those G3Ps. We're, we put two G3Ps together to make glucose in the first place, and now whatever uh, mitochondria this is is going to break that glucose apart into G3Ps. And now we're going to be able to start getting some energy out. So G3Ps are going to be converted into a three-carbon sugar called pyruvate. And during this process, we're going to get some energy out. Now we're coming down on this part of the energy diagram. We're releasing that energy. Um, we want a net gain of two ATPs during glycolysis. We've put in two, so we're actually going to get four out. 
four uncharged ADPs are going to come in. Four charged up ATPs are going to come out. We are also going to make something else. The additional thing that we're going to make is called NADH. NADH is a high energy molecule. It's another type of chemical battery, but it's not one that's available to most of the enzymes in your body. Most enzymes can only use ATP. NADH is another energy storage molecule, but it's not one that's usually available to enzymes. NAD plus is the uncharged version, two of them. These are going to get charged up and become two NADHs. Now what's going to happen to those NADHs? It sort of depends on what the organism is. Many, many, many different types of organisms can do glycolysis, but only some organisms can do uh, cellular respiration. So what's going to happen to these pyruvates and what's going to happen to these NADHs? Uh, that's going to depend on the organism. However, we're going to consider um, we're going to consider eukaryotic organisms that have plenty of oxygen first. So these NADHs, we need to get the energy back out and make them into ATPs. But we're not going to do that right now. We're going to push that back. Next, we're going to follow the fate of these pyruvate molecules. What happens to the pyruvates? So let's follow the fate of that pyruvate. Pyruvate is going to be converted into another molecule that enters into the citric acid cycle. And eventually, the pyruvate is going to be completely broken down into carbon dioxide. This process um, releases energy in the form of NADH and FADH2, which then go on to the electron transport chain. However, there's another critical ingredient for cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is really this half of the chart. Glycolysis isn't really respiration because this half of the chart depends on this ingredient, oxygen. So oxygen intake is what makes it at respiration. If oxygen is present, and if the organism can use oxygen, then cellular respiration can take place. But what if oxygen is not present? Well, then the electron transport train won't run at all, and, uh, and we won't be able to harvest the majority of the energy from the glucose. However, glycolysis still releases a little bit of energy from glucose. So if oxygen is not present, it's better to keep glycolysis going. If oxygen is not present, the pyruvate is going to take a different path. It's going to have a different fate, and it's going to undergo something called fermentation. So if no oxygen is present, fermentation will occur. Well, what is fermentation? If we, um, if we remember glycolysis, glycolysis involves an energy investment stage and then an energy harvesting stage, resulting in a net gain of two ATPs. During the energy harvesting stage, we also make two NADHs, and the cell can't use those NADHs. So they just accumulate, and eventually the cell will run out of NAD pluses. There won't be any more, and we can't get them back um, without doing another set of chemical transformations. So the whole point of fermentation is to regenerate these NAD pluses to allow glycolysis to continue. There are two different ways of doing fermentation. The first type is called lactate fermentation or lactic acid fermentation. Glycolysis um, creates ATPs, which the cell can use, and then these NADHs. And then this pyruvate molecule is transformed into a waste product called lactate or lactic acid. During the transformation of pyruvate to lactic acid, NADHs are used up. NAD pluses are regenerated, and these NAD pluses can then be used again for glycolysis. Uh, lactic acid, the root word is, is lact, uh, like, like lactose or, um, or lactase, uh, and that means milk. So uh, lactic acid is the product that is found when bacteria undergo lactic acid fermentation that makes yogurt and cheese and other fermented milk products. The, the lactic acid is what makes yogurt sour. 
lactic acid fermentation also happens in making pickles um, or sauerkraut or kimchi. Again, it's that sour taste. And our cells can even do lactic acid fermentation. So if you do uh, a really intense workout and you work so hard that your muscles use up all of the oxygen that's available and there's not enough oxygen to, uh, to run your electron transport chain, then uh, your body is going to switch over to doing lactic acid fermentation so that at least you can get a little bit of energy out of glucose by doing glycolysis. So the lactic acid builds up in your muscles and it's that lactic acid that makes your muscles really sore when you do a very intense workout. Glycolysis is not enough to keep a eukaryotic organism alive forever, um, but it is a good stopgap measure until you have a chance to breathe again and, and get more oxygen into your muscles. The other type of fermentation is called alcoholic fermentation, and this is done by yeast, which are a type of fungi. Um, and uh, it's only performed by yeast when they don't have enough oxygen, because if they have enough oxygen, then they will do cellular respiration. So um, we have this pyruvate molecule. We need to get our NAD pluses back. So again, it undergoes a conversion, regenerating NAD pluses. And in the process, it makes two waste products, which are ethanol and carbon dioxide. Humans have figured out how to harness the power of yeast. Um, we figured it out a very long time ago, thousands of years ago. We figured out that if you grow yeast without any oxygen inside a spongy bread dough, then the carbon dioxide will grow, will build up inside the uh, inside the bread and um, and make bubbles, and those bubbles will cause the bread to rise. And so we use al alcoholic fermentation in yeast to make bread rise. We also use alcoholic fermentation to make alcohol, um, clearly, uh, and that's how we get alcoholic beverages, is by fermenting, um, fermenting a, an energy source in a low oxygen environment with yeast. Okay, so if we kind of look at our total flow chart, glycolysis liberates two molecules of ATP, per glucose, the citric acid cycle liberates two, and the electron transport chain liberates 32. Now, we can't get these 32 without oxygen, but why don't we just run the citric acid cycle? Then we would at least get four ATP per glucose, and that's twice as good, right? Well, the problem is that the citric acid cycle has an enormous output of NADHs. So if you ran the citric acid cycle without oxygen, and you weren't able to run your electron transport chain, um, then you would run out of these NADHs very, very quickly. And, uh, and then you wouldn't even be able to perform glycolysis. So fermentation has to happen before the citric acid cycle when we only have two NADHs to deal with. All right, next time we're going to be considering the case where oxygen is present and we can start the citric acid cycle. What is the citric acid cycle? Um, how does it produce these NADH and FADH2 molecules?